I'm Emily Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, tech earnings are in full swing. Amazon reported sales of more than $43 billion in the third quarter. We'll break down those results along with numbers from Alphabet and Twitter. Plus, the countdown is on for the release of the iPhone 10, but the success of the device could rise and fall on its ambitious key feature. Will the new facial recognition technology set the gold standard for the industry? And Amazon gets a spare key, the online giant rolling out a new delivery feature that lets couriers in even when there's nobody home. But first, to our lead. Amazon out with third quarter sales and profit that topped analyst estimates, showing investors it can run grocery stores, churn out gadgets, expand its cloud computing business, and invest in new markets, all while selling more products online and managing expenses. For the first time, Amazon is incorporating Whole Foods into the mix. The grocery chain generated $21 million of operating income in the period, which included about a month of sales. James Chalkmock of Monas Crespi and Hart and our Bloomberg Tech reporter Olivia Zelensky Leski joined me to discuss the results. Just hats off to Jeff Bezos. I mean, what you're seeing is acceleration, you know, seven points acceleration uh, in the total business. And even when you strip out Whole Foods, you know, it's a three point acceleration on top of the acceleration that we saw in 2Q. So everything is growing and growing faster than it was before. There was a lot of scrutiny. What are the margins going to look like? Yes, North America dipped a little bit, but international is holding flat. And at the same time, you saw an uptick again in the AWS margin where there was some fears about uh, the, the pricing pressures there. So all in all, um, you know, t t gold star. Olivia, let's start with Whole Foods. They they had about a month of sales included here. What are we seeing there? Well, we saw an increase of about 21 million in operating income for Whole Foods, which is really just based off one month mm -hmm. of sales. And I think there's a lot of investors are curious to know, you know, how uh, is Whole Foods doing within the Amazon brand, and 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 what's happening here? Is it a sustainable interest in the brand, or is it really just some rubbernecking that consumers are having as they're interested, uh, as there's been a huge amount of publicity? around Whole Foods. So, um, James, let's talk a little bit about the cloud. I recently spoke with AWS CEO Andy Jassy, who you know, runs the cloud business. This is a business that's on track uh, to you know, multiply as well over the next decade. Uh, mm -hmm. Take a listen to what he had to say about growth in AWS. It's certainly grown, grown really fast, and I don't think any of us would have had the audacity to predict it would grow as fast as it has. But I think we, we always believed it had the chance to be a really significant business. James, what are you expecting to see when it comes to the cloud business? I mean, look, it's interesting, you know, they, Amazon originally built AWS for themselves, you know, and then turned it into a product. And, and I think you're seeing the successes of that translate into other parts of their business as well. But as you look into the cloud opportunity, obviously there's a couple of horsemen there, you know, that are, uh, are, are leading the pack. But at the end of the day, you know, when it comes to which company is putting out the number of features at the iterative rate uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, Amazon's putting out, it, there's only one company. I mean, they're putting out 700, 800 new features every single year and listening exactly to what the customers want. So AWS will continue to be a, uh, a source of funds for the company to subsidize the other aspects of their business, which is what makes them precisely so dangerous. And by the way, Whole Foods generated $21 million in operating income in that month. I believe I said 27 at the start uh, of the hour. Olivia, talk about what else they, 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 they discussed in this report. They really focused on consumer electronics. Uh, that was a fascinating part of the report, is the focus on these devices, Alexa, for example, that you have in your home. You usually have it in your kitchen. You could order groceries through Alexa voice services. Um, I think that the earnings report really shows that that's a key strategy moving forward. And that all of these products and, and services are really integrated. It, it kind of reminds me of, of Apple when Apple was really hot uh, several years ago with all these various devices that all spoke to each other and worked within each, with each other and it created this ecosystem so you didn't want to go outside of the Apple experience. And I think that we're starting to see that now with Amazon. James, Amazon's hardware efforts mm -hmm. haven't always you know, been massive successes. You look at the Amazon phone, for example. Uh, you know, the Kindle got off to a bit of a of a rocky start. Do you have how much faith do you have in these new hardware efforts? Whether it's the Echo, whether the, the, it's this new service, Amazon Key. 
I, w I would say it's not as much on the hardware devices itself as it is on Alexa. Because what Amazon is doing is exactly taking a page out of Google's playbook with Android and it's making Alexa completely ubiquitous, not across just their devices, but acro across uh, third party devices as well, uh, forging massive partnerships with the likes of uh, BMW as of late. And, and I think that ubiquity is going to open up more and more opportunities to gather data, collect data, and also um, open up commerce opportunities, uh, not just related to um, uh, the, uh, the offerings that they have on the site, uh, but more so getting you hooked on, I think the, the next iteration is gonna be food, uh, to really create a daily habit uh, of ordering from Amazon. So I think there's a lot of buckets of opportunity, 500 billion to a trillion dollars in value uh, that the company has yet to unlock. So, I mean, look, this th after this quarter, this, this company is very, very dangerous. So, you know, sleep with one eye open. <laughs> right, and Amazon Prime, obviously, the subscription service, very key. Yeah, we saw that increase 59%, continuing to grow, and that's another strategy with Whole Foods, is getting people to sign up for Prime. Uh, you know, you get your, your salmon for a little bit less if you're a Prime member, so we're, we're going to see that continue to grow as well. That was James Chalkmock of Monas, Crespi, and Hart, and Bloomberg Technologies' Olivia Zaleski. Meantime, shares of Twitter gained the most in more than a year after adding 4 million monthly active users and reporting better than expected revenue for the third quarter. Industry watchers caution that more consistent performance is needed to prove that Twitter can sustain user growth. But as one analyst put it, the bleeding has stopped. I discussed the results with Melissa Parrish, Vice President and Research Director at Forrester Research and Bloomberg Technologies' Selena Wang. Managing expectations is an art and Twitter seems to have mastered that as well. So, you know, cautious optimism on this side? Selena, Twitter has been miscounting its users for the last three years. So even though there was an increase in 4 million users, they only increased total users by 2 million because 2 million of those users were not actually using the platform. Right, and what's shocking is that this had been miscalculated for several years and only just now are they realizing that they had this mistake. Now, it was only a couple million uh, per year and over a broad base of users. It's not a huge impact, but it does show a bigger gain uh, over some years, and it shows that actually between two quarters, formerly in which it looked like users were stagnant, they actually fell. Hmm. So it's definitely uh, not a good time for them to be testing trust with investors and with analysts about really the quality and the accuracy of their numbers. Melissa, does this miscount concern you about, you know, Twitter simply having its own house in order? Uh, I think that is the fair assessment. I am less concerned about the actual numbers themselves. Um, you know, they were not huge uh, errors in, in calculation. Uh, so that's not concerning, but it does uh, it does raise questions of, of uh, trust, I suppose, in, the, in the, vali the validity of numbers. I should point out, however, that their very large name competitors have also had to come back to the market and say that they have uh, mismeasured this and miscounted that and, uh, you know, Know, depending on the company you're talking about, these things seem to matter more. Uh, Twitter in a position of needing to turn around growth and show some more sustained earnings. Uh, I think this news has a, a little bit of a bigger impact on them than some of its competitors. Selena, you know, Twitter has been, been piloting a number of different new products, whether it's video streaming, whether it's moments. Are, are we seeing any of these products having more traction than others? Well, interestingly enough, the businesses that grew the most were actually the video advertising as well as um, their data licensing business, which isn't talked about that much, but it's actually growing at a double digit rate. Mm -hmm. uh, now, DAU has been increasing. They said uh, about 14%, which is acceleration. But at the same time, they don't actually report the base of daily active users, so it's really hard for investors to wrap their mind around what exactly does this mean. But the biggest uh, risk factor in these earnings was that U.S. revenue, which is their most important advertising market, fell more than 10 percent. Uh, meantime, Melissa, Twitter's been making some changes in how at least it talks about how they are working on the online harassment problem. We know that Twitter will be, along with Facebook and Google, testifying uh, before Congress, uh, you know, regarding fake news, regarding Russian uh, infiltration of its platform. How, how concerning are all of these issues combined? I think for Twitter, these issues are quite concerning. It is a question of trust, not just uh, investor trust and confidence, but marketer trust and confidence, user trust and confidence. Any uh, customer-facing business 
that's trying to increase usership in a sustained way has to show that they're creating a, a safe, comfortable environment in which to engage. Uh, and all of the press around um, uh, you know, questionable advertising and testifying before Congress is certainly not going to do anything to increase user confidence. Uh, I think we also need to see some more concrete answers about what exactly the steps are that are being taken to protect consumers from things like bullying and harassment. That was Melissa Parrish with Forrester Research and Bloomberg's Selena Wang. Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News, is developing a global breaking news network for the Twitter service. Now, in deal news, Cisco is buying software maker Broadsoft in a deal valued at $1.9 billion. The move helps expand Cisco's presence in software and the cloud, which has been a huge priority for the company. And it caps off a busy year of deal making. The purchase of Broadsoft marks the ninth acquisition for Cisco this year. Coming up, one member of Congress has some strong words for Silicon Valley. Representative Ro Khanna of California joins us on the show. And later, Amazon is proposing a new service that could change the game for deliveries and expand the tech giant's offerings for its users. We will explain. This is Bloomberg. On November 1st, three of the top tech firms will testify before Congress to answer questions about Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. elections. But one congressman isn't waiting until then to challenge Silicon Valley. Representative Ro Khanna of California has penned a stirring op-ed in the Washington Post titled, Trump Beat Silicon Valley at Its Own Game. Now it must prove itself. Congressman Khanna explained his agenda from Washington. Trump was very effective in using Twitter and Facebook to get passionate support to get his message out. Uh, but a lot of these platforms, of course, were abused. Uh, they amplified fake voices, uh, extreme voices that pretended to be 10,000 people, even though there was only one person. Uh, they trafficked in false news. Uh, and so uh, tech needs to help uh, figure out how to uh, solve some of these issues. Uh, we know it can empower individuals in extraordinary ways, but we need to fix the excess that we saw in the 2016 election cycle. Right. You say tech tools should strengthen, not weaken democracy. And Russian interference aside, some would argue that, you know, social media has dramatically increased the number of voices that are being heard. You know, can tech companies really be responsible for all of this? Well, I actually think tech has played a very positive role overall. I mean, it gave a, the rise to Barack Obama, to Bernie Sanders. I often joke at town halls that the average person can have more of a voice by having a clever tweet or Facebook post uh, than I can by speaking to an empty chamber in Congress. So uh, tech has empowered individuals in extraordinary ways. But that said, there are things that now that they have become a platform where almost 50 percent of Americans get their news there that they need to do. One is having some basic a differentiation between fact and opinion. Uh, newspapers, TV stations like yours have third-party verification, and they independently check uh, facts. There can be third-party verification on some of the posts. They should look at uh, providing perhaps an alternative perspective if viewers want that alternative perspective. They just need to look at what their journalistic responsibilities can be without suppressing the freedom of expression. And I'm encouraged that a number of tech companies are uh, doing that and that dialogue has begun. You wonder, though, how far these companies can go, how well companies can distinguish between fact and opinion when our own president may have a different opinion of the facts than the facts. I agree. It's a very difficult issue, but there are independent third-party sites which can at least rate content. So if someone is out there saying the sky is green uh, or uh, that, you know, Barack Obama isn't an American citizen, they could at least have a rating uh, and a verification, just like newspapers do, just like television stations do. Or they could provide a link to say, here are some alternative uh, perspectives if you so choose. Uh, I think these tech companies, look, the tech company and social media is very different than television. Uh, television isn't as interactive. People aren't uh, responding to me. It's uh, a broadcast to individuals, and tech is a person-to-person -person communication. So tech can't be responsible for every single post uh, and the content of every single post. That said, they do need to move towards adopting some journalistic standards of third-party verification, fact verification, so that they give uh, users uh, an informed perspective.
That said, I wonder how much can we rely on companies to do the right thing or whatever is in the best interest of society rather than what's in the best interest of their business? And how much should the government actually be in charge of figuring out whether there's Russian interference on these platforms? Should there be government regulation? Well, I think there are two different uh, questions. In terms of uh, the best interest for society, I think that was uh, Silicon Valley's tradition with David Packard and uh, Hewlett Packard, some of the early founders, Andy Grove, they talked about uh, building uh, technology in a way that would help society, help empower people. And if you talk to tech leaders, that's what they really hope, that their platforms would help uh, improve communication, lead to a more connected world, create more jobs. Uh, Tim Cook recently said that business leaders have a moral responsibility to care about education and jobs. Uh, Sundar Pichai recently announced a $1 billion initiative to prepare folks for the tech jobs of the future. Uh, so I think there is an ongoing awareness with tech leaders that they have to care about their contribution uh, to jobs in places that don't have them and to the democratic conversation, given that they are some of the largest companies uh, in the nation uh, and, some of them, and have such great uh, responsibility and so many viewers. On the Russia issue, uh, I think there uh, we definitely need better intelligence sharing between tech companies and the government so that uh, they can get advance notice if there is suspicious activity and act on it. And uh, tech companies need to uh, help adopt exceptional processing to look at uh, false accounts or bad accounts, bad actors, uh, the way uh, some banks have. Some of it is hiring more people, uh, but even if they hire thousands of more people, given the volume, they probably need investments in machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to do uh, some of that work. So I'm hopeful a lot of it will be tech coming to its own conclusion, but some, there will probably be a role for uh, Congress and lawmakers as well to have constructive rules that uh, tech can follow. Similarly, you talk about the importance of increasing diversity at these companies, upward mobility. Is this something that you think companies can do on their own? We know that the representation of women and minorities at tech companies is, is very low. Or is this something that the government should regulate? Well, I think it's in the tech company's own advantage to expand their imagination in recruiting. Let me give you a concrete example. 45% of African Americans who have STEM degrees uh, go to a historically black college or university. 45%. Now, if tech companies want to expand where there's talent, uh, they should form partnerships with some of the best historically black colleges and universities in the country and recruit from there. The NFL in the 1960s, the Oakland Raiders uh, did that. They started recruiting at the HBCUs, and it gave them a whole competitive advantage over the rest of the teams in the NFL. At a time where we have such scarcity for engineers and tech talent, and everyone's concerned that Google and Facebook and Apple is getting all the talent, uh, expanding the pool and going to places like HBCUs would make a difference. Same with... Right. Uh, in yeah, go ahead. But the question the question isn't whether whether or not they should it's whether the government should force them to do so or legislate you know various requirements for representation of women and minorities in in your ranks well, I'm not for uh, quotas or government re regulating that, but I do think government can make investments in uh, women's uh, schools uh, that focus on STEM, in uh, HBCUs, in providing greater uh, opportunities and pathways and giving incentives for corporate mentorship for women leaders. I think government can incentivize the creation of uh, the pipeline uh, and in getting people into those leadership ranks, but I don't think they should regulate uh, a number uh, that tech companies have to uh, fill as a, as a quota, I think that would be going too far. Congressman Ro Khanna there. Coming up, Bayer is teaming up with a Boston-based startup to break into the next phase of farming technology. Details next. Plus, allegations of gender discrimination in Silicon Valley are anything but new, but one lawsuit could be a game changer if the plaintiff gets permission to represent over 125 female engineers. This is Bloomberg.
With its proposed $66 billion acquisition of Monsanto, Bayer has been slowly shifting toward a life sciences-focused company. Bloomberg's Ann Mostu visited the Bayer Life Science Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a new unit of the company that's investing in the growing field of agriculture technology. Check it out. Something's growing at Bayer. The company's making a big bet that it can make plants fertilize themselves. We actually believe we have the responsibility to solve the big issues that even may take five, ten years. And according to Axel Bouchon, head of the Bayer Life Science Center, one of those big issues, reinventing how crops grow, it's an effort to help farmers respond to a growing population and reduce waste. On a much diminished land, you have to feed more people. And uh, that's why we believe the demand for, in essence, self-fertilizing plants is the demand for the future. Bayer's Life Science Center is teaming up on a $100 million venture with Ginkgo Bioworks, a Boston-based biotech startup. They aim to mimic genomes like those found in peanuts that automatically provide nitrogen and apply them to crops that don't have the capability, like corn, wheat, and rice. Ginkgo's CEO, Jason Kelly, explains. We're taking the genetic design from those peanut microbes and moving it over to the ones that like to live on vegetables. The idea being, then they can start to self-fertilize. We could use less nitrogen fertilizer, save farmers money, and also give consumers a more environmentally friendly food. Fertilizer has raised pollution concerns, and it's among the most costly inputs for farmers. Growers today are spending about $80 billion a year on nitrogen fertilizer alone, and there's other types of fertilizer too. So there's an enormous expense, both in the actual uh, fertilizer you're buying, but also in getting it out onto the field. Self-fertilizing plants are one way for growers to increase efficiency after years of declining crop prices. The Bloomberg Agriculture Index has lost half its value over the last five years. That and declines in arable land amid population growth have boosted investment into agriculture technology companies like Ginkgo Bioworks. Goldman Sachs has said the growing market may be worth $240 billion by 2050. We have to look differently at fundamental breakthroughs, simply because they need an entirely different approach. They need actually 10 times the money, they need 10 times the time, or the patience, if you will, but actually, mostly it needs 10 times the guts, <laughs> the brains, and actually the heart. Hmm? And that's why these big ideas only work in partnerships. The effort to reduce fertilizer waste comes as Bayer awaits approval for its $66 billion takeover of Monsanto, the world's largest seed company. I don't see a conflict there. We would benefit from kind of having this together because the microbes that we try to develop would perfectly fit to the chemicals we have and to the seeds we potentially would have. Buyer's bet is in its early stages. They're giving it five years to see if the technology will make it to its crops in Sacramento, California for further testing. And Mostu, Boston, Bloomberg. Uber is expanding its operations in Europe. The ride-hailing giant will open a new service center in Lisbon to provide assistance to drivers and passengers in France, Spain, and Portugal. The company expects to create 250 new jobs from this venture. Meantime, in London, Uber is still seeking an appeal of its license ban. Coming up, tech earnings are in full swing. We will break down Alphabet's results next. And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the Best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. 
Tech earnings were in full swing. Alphabet reported revenue of over $22 billion in its third quarter report, encouraging investors and sending shares to an all-time high. Google's ad business continued to be the company's juggernaut, with revenue overall rising over 24%. We had the opportunity to speak with CFO Ruth Porat after the numbers were released. We discussed their relationship with the EU, M&A, and growing political pressure. She also called out the other bet segment, which helped to strengthen the quarter. I spoke with Ben Legg, CEO of Ad Parlor and former COO of Google Europe, about the numbers. A lot of mobile companies, um, you know, their products are increasingly commoditized and they're looking for you know, what's the maximum they can squeeze out of those sort of revenue shares from Google. So I think this, it will go up. There's probably other areas of traffic acquisition cost too, where there's a lot of upward pressure for Google in areas like uh, display revenue shares as well. So I think it's something that to a large extent uh, we just have to get used to is there will be a, a trend upwards. Clearly Google will do everything they can to, to uh, slow that growth but uh, I don't think it's going to reverse anytime soon. So when you look at the numbers it seems like most most things are otherwise going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. What are the main highlights the main standouts to you? Uh, so um, obviously the sort of overall growth beat expectations uh, they, they haven't broken out or at least I haven't seen if they're broken out where that's come from but uh, my bet is a lot of that will be coming from YouTube YouTube is doing very well I know there have been lots of questions lately around you know has YouTube recovered from the whole brand safety scare earlier in the year um, certainly all the evidence I've seen suggests they are we've seen meaningful price increases we've seen pretty much uh, almost every single advertiser uh, back on YouTube so that's certainly a highlight um, um, uh, beyond that, I think just uh, it's overall um, health in the ads business. Now, uh, clearly there's a lot of other bets out there. The revenue is growing, but the losses are continuing. So there's no, there's no real, at least what I've seen so far, no real standout success. Uh, but clearly revenue growth of something like 50% year on year in the other bets is a good sign. Um, but uh, to sort of um, to start being meaningfully profitable and contribute to the bottom line, we'll need a lot more growth yet. Other bets revenue now totaling $3.4 billion and actually CapEx spending on those bets has dropped dramatically year over year. They spent $324 million on other bets last year, same time this year, that's $77 million. Ruth Porat told me that's mainly because uh, they're spending less on Google Fiber right now. They're really focusing on developing the technology before expanding it. Um, and she also spoke specifically about how they decide where to continue to invest in other bets. Uh, she said, what we're looking to do with other bets is create valuable businesses over the longer term. What we do is a multi-year financial model, establish business, technology, and financial milestones. It's really a multi-year look at creating what we believe are multi-year opportunities. And she singled out Waymo, the self-driving car unit, and she said they're very pleased with progress they've made when it comes to safety, when it comes to ways that self-driving cars can help cities. But there's also this sense that they're thinning out their, their investments in other bets. Ben, what do you make of that? I think they have to. They have to be uh, disciplined around this. The reality is um, for Google or, or for, for Alphabet to actually build something that will meaningfully change their results or change the world, they need to only be pro focusing on bets that can generate at least, say, $10 billion in revenue and meaningful profits. Now, very few bets that any company can, company can make have a reasonable chance of building a $10, $20, 30000000000 billion business. So they, they really do need to think through what are the things that can really change the world, that will really generate a lot of revenue, and that uh, Alphabet has a meaningful, uh, a sort of, uh, a good chance of being one of the winners and clearly driverless cars is one of the is a massive opportunity and then obviously the auto industry is massive and it seems like uh, alphabet is ahead of the pack or at least you know up one of the front runners in that area so i think they're absolutely right to focus there um yeah there's probably a lot of other bets within uh, alphabet where they say this is going to be too small or we're too far behind or there's too much competition that was ben Legg, ceo of ad parlor the recent groundswell of women speaking out and alleging gender discrimination at tech and venture capital firms is shedding light on the rocky terrain women face culturally and professionally in Silicon Valley. Google, Microsoft, Oracle, Uber, and Twitter are all facing similar lawsuits on this matter. Tina Huang, a former engineer at Twitter, filed a suit two years ago alleging the company systematically thwarts the advancement of female engineers. Since then, she has been gathering data on gender and pay for her peers and believes she can prove that Twitter stack the deck. 
By early next year, she plans to ask a state judge for permission to represent 133 female engineers at Twitter. This would be the first group case of its kind in Silicon Valley, if certified. Twitter has rejected these claims in court filings. Our Bloomberg News legal reporter Jill Rosenblatt and Jason Lohr, an employment attorney who represents Tina Huang, joined me to discuss the case. What makes this case different is the plaintiff, is Ms. Huang herself. She feels very strongly uh, that uh, she was denied a promotion due to her gender. She feels that her contemporaries at Twitter, other female engineers, have also been denied advancement, and she's really det uh, willing to take this case to trial. But how do we know she was denied these things based on her gender and not her performance? Well, so in this case, um, so this is a class action case. In many of these cases, uh, discrimination cases, are individual cases. And Tina's, in this case, she's seeking to represent all of the women engineers at Twitter. And the case is based on a theory called disparate impact. And what that means is basically the promotion process, while maybe it wasn't devised to discriminate against women, the impact of the process adversely affects women. And to put it simply, what we're saying is that it took women longer to get promotions and, it, and fewer women uh, had promotions than we might expect. Ellen Powell felt passionately about her case too. Uh, Joel, what do you think makes this case different? Well, so Ellen Powell's case was really about Ellen Powell. There was uh, discrimination claims in her suit, um, but it was uh, there was a lot of uh, harassment. Uh, it was more focused on on the harassment, and it was focused on 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 Ellen Powell. This this is as Jason was explaining is about a systematic bias at Twitter against women. So it differs differs a lot from Ellen Powell's case in that in that way in particular. Uh, Twitter did give you a statement saying Twitter is deeply committed to a diverse and supportive workplace and we believe the facts will show Ms. Huang was tweeted, treated fairly. Joel, what do you think is the likelihood this actually gets certified as a class action suit? There well, is no precedent for this. There's no precedent that I'm aware of. I right. think I think what what what, what what this is going to turn on is the data that that uh, Tina is able to to turn up uh, extract from Twitter and marshal in her favor and if she's able to extract numbers and data that make that support her case I think I mean it seems like a good there's a good chance uh, I think it all depends on that um, I've seen some of those numbers and they uh, initially filed in the lawsuit they've changed there's a there's a dispute between Tina and Twitter about mm -hmm about those numbers that's going to be resolved or mean taken up uh, in court this week on Thursday. So Jason, what can you tell us about these numbers and what they show? Well, of course I'm hesitant to talk about getting into the nitty gritty of the evidence of this case. But what I can tell you is the data is going to be really important mm. for, for us. We're going to have to, what we're going to basically have to show is that fewer women were promoted than statistically we would think uh, should happen. Mm -hmm. that's, that's to say that more men are being promoted than women. Um, and we're still working with, with Twitter to get that data. We're, there's some bumps in the roads, but I'm confident that that's what the data will show. Now, how do you think the climate right now, I mean, we've seen many, many sexual harassment allegations, especially in the last uh, year. We've seen men get fired. We've seen the CEO of Uber resign. Uh, some people have said if Ellen Powell filed her suit today, maybe she would have won. Do you think the environment matters? or will have an impact here? I think the environment matters in terms of decisions, right? Um, I think it matters um, for judges what, you know, what cases came before. I don't think that the climate matters for, for judges. Um, juries, uh, you know, maybe Jason's probably the better person to ask about that, but I think, um, the, the way the climate really shapes these is, are, are, uh, shapes these kind of suits are in terms of um, encouraging and motivating other women to come forward. So I think you begin to see, you begin to see more of these cases, um, but but how they how the, the outcomes kind of depend on uh, precedent and, and and the legal the legal issues. I think. Jason, have you been talking to other engineers at Twitter, female engineers at Twitter, and what do they say? Well, so I think that uh, the the folks we've spoken with. 
say that clearly there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you look at the statistics from when we filed the case in 2015, if you looked across Twitter, 35% uh, of the employees were women. If you looked at just the technical positions, uh, engineers, less than 10% of those folks were women. And uh, everyone we've spoken to seems to agree that that is impacting um, the work environment. Just the fact that the, the population there is skewed so heavily towards males. So next steps, when will we know for sure? So the next step in our case is class certification, which we're hoping uh, that the class will be certified or at least we'll have a decision as early as March of next year. Mm -hmm. Once that done, and assuming that we're able to proceed uh, as, a, as a class action, then we need to get a little more data to see if we can uh, really, really prove up what we're, what we're saying is happening over there. That was Bloomberg News reporter Joel Rosenblatt and Dacian Lore, an employment attorney. And a quick disclosure, Bloomberg LP is developing a global breaking news network for the Twitter service. Coming up, Apple has struggled to solve technical issues around the iPhone 10 from the OLED screen, facial recognition, and 3D sensors. We'll break down what's going on behind the scenes at the company. This is Bloomberg. Interest in the iPhone 10 is mounting as the countdown to its November 3rd release begins. This is one of the most ambitious devices Apple has ever brought to market. The technology posed several challenges for Apple, from facial recognition to 3D sensors. Bloomberg Tech's Alex Webb has been, has been covering what's going on behind closed doors at Apple and in the supply chain, and looking into whether the tech giant will be ready to get the iPhone 10 in the hands of consumers next week. Alex joined us along with Crawford Del Pret, IDC Chief Research Officer. What we're talking about here is a technology which previously was only in the Microsoft Connect, which was you know, the size of a kind of a large hardback book. They've reduced this down to the size a few centimeters across and a few millimeters deep. The realm, the realm of error, the margin of error in that is tiny. And in order then to make it possible for their suppliers and their component makers and module assemblers, people who take components and build them into a package, which are then ship to the Foxcons of the world, they had to reduce some of the specifications in order to make it possible to ship it in the quantities they needed. So what does this actually mean? Well, I mean, from a consumer... Is the technology going to be any different than advertised? From a consumer perspective, I don't think anybody will be able to tell any difference, frankly. You know, the difference they were talking about for the Touch ID, one in 50,000 people could spoof your fingerprint. For Face ID, they're saying it's one in a million. Now, I have no idea whether, unfortunately, from our sourcing, they cut some of these um, specs before or after they released that one, million, one in a million figure. But the likelihood is it's still going to be infinitely better than Touch ID. Now, Apple's statement on your reporting. Bloomberg's claim that it reduced the accuracy spec for Face ID is completely false, and we expect Face ID to be the new gold standard for facial authentication. The quality and accuracy of Face ID haven't changed. It continues to be one in a million probability of a random person unlocking your iPhone with Face ID. I mean, it speaks to what I said before. You know, that perhaps suggests that it might have happened before they released that that um, that number. But you know, we stand by our reporting. We've got very good confidence in the people we spoke to, and they're very close to what's been going on. Crawford, what do you make of this? Yeah, I think that this is about the tolerance of where Apple potentially started versus what they're going to live up to when they ship. And the fact of the matter is, as Alex says, if they live up to that one in a million, then they then they they haven't reduced it, and the consumer will never know. Um, if there's a reliability problem, if people experience you know, situations in low light, um, in uh, ways that you know doesn't necessarily recognize it, then that would be an issue. We don't believe that will be the case. Apple is clearly coming out and saying that they're standing by but behind this technology. We have said we think there'll be somewhere between three and four million devices at launch. We're standing behind that number. We think it's going to. We have no reason to believe it won't be a successful launch. Alex, walk us through how facial recognition technology, Apple's facial recognition technology, is expected to work. So there are fundamentally three components here that matter. There's what they call the flood illuminator, which is much like a torch. <coughs> it flashes around and sees, oh, there's a face. Now, it then palms, passes on the action to what they call the, the dot projector, which is very computationally intense. They do not want it to be on the whole time. This flashes 30,000 dots at your face. The infrared camera then detects that, pop, puts it through their algorithms and recognizes this is the person who is I should allow or should not allow to unlock the phone. So Crawford, how difficult 
would you say, is it to manufacture this kind of technology at scale? Uh, it's very difficult to manufacture at scale. These are, these are precision products, and we've heard a lot of um, rumor and innuendo that yield has been a problem. I mean, there have been manufacturing yield numbers thrown out of 60% of 50%. Those are, those are really unacceptable when you think about a high volume manufactured product. Those yields have to come up to the 90, 80, 70, even 70% uh, over time. And I think that they will get better, but this is a very, very expensive product. This product has a premium price point, um, and there is gonna be fallout around some of those components. We, we've definitely seen that in the supply chain. Are there any other components that are causing potential issues? Well, we've reported going back a year that there were constraints in OLED. It seems as though they've broken the back of that. I think the, the flood projector as well, this other infrared laser, they had some issues with that. We, we had from our sources, the yield actually on the dot projector alone was about 20% at one yeah, stage, just... and for the flood illuminator was about 40%. Now it's above 50 for both of those, but it's still a long way from the 90% which yeah. they're comfortable with. Yeah, so I mean, they. so so again, I, I would just say that, um, you know, we, we believe that um, Apple will ship optimistically somewhere, say, 37 million iPhone Xs in Q4. We're now feeling like that's, that's at the very high end, not only based on uh, the components we're talking about today, uh, but also based on OLED availability. I mean, don't forget, Samsung has the absolute lion's share of these screens locked up, and they take a significant amount themselves. So OLED, we're not willing to say, is not going to be a constraint going forward, and certainly going into next year. Uh, that's shipping. What about demand? Are you expecting demand to, you know, there, be, be, be higher than uh, ever, um, despite uh, this $1,000 yeah. price tag? Our expectation is that there will be unsatisfied demand in Q4. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a very, very hot product when people uh, are you know, lining up for it, trying to get it. They, they will not be able to meet initial demand in Q4, we don't believe. I think one thing also to take away from our story, we go into very great depth. This is one detail of the story, which obviously Apple hasn't been very happy with, but we go into very great depth about the supply chain. And I think the big takeaway is they have broken the back of a lot of the problems they had with the 3D sensors. This was one of the ways they did it. There are other ways as well. Please read our story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Crawford. So, you know, what do you expect? Uh, Pre-order start on Friday. Yep. You can go to the store and buy it the following Friday. Yeah. If you stand in line, yeah. uh, presumably, but, but but how do you expect uh, the 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 demand and supply curve to unfold? <clears throat> um, I think that they are going to be fairly supply constrained. As we said, our expectation is somewhere around four million at launch. They probably ship somewhere optimistically uh, thirty-seven million, probably more realistically somewhere in the thirty million mm -hmm. range for Q4. Uh, and then our expectation is, um, as you get out um, I I I I into next year, um, you know, we're looking at. Um, you know, 50% of their phones will be high end. We're looking at about 240 million units next year. Not all iPhone X, that's all, right. all iPhones in general. Half of those will be the larger size of which iPhone X will be included. And what are you seeing with the iPhone 8? Um, iPhone 8 demand is, uh, our expectation is, is pretty strong. Our expectation for this quarter, about 15 million. Uh, right. unit shipped. Last I, word, I think one interesting idea will be the fact it'll be important to have the iPhone 10 in stores because I think there probably are a lot of iPhone 8 buyers who are waiting to hold the two side by side and say, do I really want to spend $300 more on this? And if they don't, they'll buy the iPhone 8. That was IDC's Crawford Del Pret and Bloomberg Tech's Alex Webb. Meantime, Android creator Andy Rubin is feeling the heat of a crowded smartphone market. His newest creation, the Essential Phone, is getting a price cut of $200. The price is now $499. It originally cost $699. This comes after reports of disappointing sales for the new smartphone. The launch of other new devices from the likes of Apple and Google also could have hurt the company. Customers who already bought a device are being offered a $200 credit. Coming up, Amazon has a new service that will let them into your home. The latest on the online retail giant steps to make sure you never miss a package. Next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. As we've been reporting, more than 200 cities are currently bidding to secure the location of Amazon's second headquarters. Real estate investor and Starwood Capital Group chairman and CEO Barry Sternlich spoke to Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker and said he's betting on one city in particular. They create so much demand and cities are so excited to have So them. far, they're not building their own buildings. Yeah. 
No, they don't want it on their balance sheet, but they, are, they do on their own distribution centers. So I'm not clear why. I guess they can't do everything, even though it looks like they're trying to do everything. Um, yeah, I think Boston has a pretty good shot at that, given that it's as far away in the technology mm -hmm. and the infrastructure and the educational base and just the zeitgeist of the city. So we'll see how that turns out. The other places you would think they might go are the southeast. Atlanta. Raleigh, Durham, mm -hmm. Atlanta, places with a good industry technology. Atlanta is very affordable. Transportation hub. Transportation hub. And in other Amazon news, the online retail giant wants to make missed deliveries a thing of the past. The new service, dubbed Amazon Key, will let Amazon deliver packages directly into your home. It will also let selected services like house cleaners and dog walkers in while you're away. The service works with an electronic lock and a security camera that will film the person entering your home. Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman joined us to explain. It's interesting. It seems like every other week we're here talking about a new Echo, a new Fire TV, a new tablet, whatever. Now it's security cameras. It's a hot space right now. Nest came out with theirs. Everyone is coming out with a security system now for the home. This is Amazon's approach, and they're tying it directly into how they make money. Packages, right? People buy stuff online. Now this is just another tool that Amazon is selling to help people get their stuff. So this would literally be a package delivery person entering your home. Right? Right. And what about security concerns? You know, it, it's interesting. We haven't heard back from them yet about if Amazon has some insurance program or the liability or the terms of service that a user has to agree to. Are you waiving your right to, you know, sue Amazon mm -hmm. or file a complaint if something goes wrong? I'm sure that the people are vetted and there's never, I mean, they hope there won't be a circumstance like that, but the reality is letting a person into your home, which is a sacred place for many, is not an easy thing. So how do they convince people that this is worth it. Well, there's two things. In terms of buying the hardware, I think it's you know a no-brainer purchase. If you look at the specs on this thing, the video quality that it records, the app integration, it's actually 120 bucks, which is a really good price. That's about half the price of some of the closest competitors from Nest and other smart home camera makers. So from that perspective, I think it's a cool product. But in terms of the Amazon key, letting people into your home aspect of the service, I think that's a tougher sell for now. So how does this fit in with all of the other, well, fit in with the Echo uh, and other home-based devices? Right. I mean, all of Amazon's devices are designed to sell you more stuff from Amazon, whether that's buying stuff with your voice. Now, this is another conduit, another element of that system of people buying things and now having a security camera. They're also going to be selling a subscription service for cloud storage of the video recordings. So that's another way they're going to make money from this, too. Um, you know, and, and how does this fit into the broader delivery efforts in general? Obviously, Amazon is trying to take on more of that, you know, delivery logistics problem, you know, take it, taking it away from UPS and away from FedEx. Right. This is another element to it. And Amazon is getting some more competition lately. I mean, there was a time where you couldn't think of anyone other than Amazon as where you're going to buy your stuff. Now there's Walmart. Walmart's a big competitor, and they've actually announced a similar service. Now Amazon is fighting back with a little bit more of an integrated approach, the integration with smart locks the integration with their new uh, cloud camera tech as well. So what are you going to be watching as we head into the holidays and all of this stuff converges at once? It's going to be interesting to see how the different companies create their platforms as a way to lock people into their ecosystem. It's, it's going to be interesting to see if there's going to be some people who are going to buy some Apple devices, some Google, some Nest, some Amazon. And I think that the competition is going to heat up and you're going to see everyone trying to get a piece of every different device. What's the hottest speaker on the market? What hottest do you think? What's Mark Gurman? What Mark, Mark Gurman? Well, actually, stay tuned to Gadgets with Gurman. Right. Here's my plug. We're going to be comparing all the hottest new Sonos One, the HomePod, everything down the road. Uh, I've been listening to the Sonos One at home for the last few weeks. That's the one. It's a Sonos speaker with Alexa. It actually sounds really good. So stay tuned to more on that. That was Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We will bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in each day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. And remember, all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.